for your word we bless you for times like this we bless you for what you are doing in our lives we bless you that Lord you are increasing us day by day we bless you that Lord you are making us each moment to be conformed to your image and so Father we thank you Lord we are come our hearts are ready do your will in our lives. And Father, consecrate us to yourself. And so we thank you, Lord. We bless you. We ask that you will continue with us in the rest of this session. Thank you for hearing us. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Worship of God's resources. That has been the title of the seminar. Stewardship of God's resources. And we we'll have, we want to believe that by now you appreciate the fact that God owns everything. We want to believe by, that by now you have appreciated the divine ownership of God over everything. By the time you are leaving this place, you have to live with an understanding and an attitude of heart that you don't own anything. I mean, you should go not only with an understanding, but also with this attitude of heart that you don't own anything. And that's going to look strange, but that's what the Bible says, that you don't own anything, so you accept it with God and let it become your attitude. We say that is fundamental. Fundamental in the sense that if you don't get it, if you don't have that attitude, you are not going to be relevant as a Christian. You are not going to be living your life well. You are not going to be fulfilling the purpose of God for your life. And you are not going to be living for God. You are not going to be relevant as a Christian. So it's fundamental and everybody must, must have that as an attitude aside from a correct understanding. You don't own anything, not even a pin in your house. The house that you use your money to build is not your own. The car that you have bought is not your own. The children that are given into your care are not your own. Even the body you have, the clothes you are putting on, the shoes you have, the hair on your head is not your own. It must be an understanding. It must also be an attitude. It is fundamental. And if you don't get it, you will not be relevant. If you don't get it, you don't fit into good works. If you don't get it, you are not going to be capable of doing good works. Praise the Lord. So we want to take maybe one or two questions. And... Uh, we will finally conclude. Are there issues in your classes that you could not resolve? Are there, is there any question that you needed to ask in your class? And maybe because of time you couldn't ask. You want to ask it now. We will quickly take it before we round up to pray. There was this statement uh, our leader made. Though I know quite all right that he's trying to tell us that you have to deal with the body and don't give him, I mean, give it everything it demands. So, but he said something that if you see a pastor or a minister of God who is having a kind of a protruded uh, stomach, that is a thief. So, and I don't, actually, I don't like that statement. So I want to know the reason why it should make so, you know, sometimes it may be natural that somebody will have a kind of uh, stomach. So that doesn't make him a thief. So that's the reason why. Praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. In the study we all agree that our body is not our own. That it is given to us by God. We read in Genesis, the Bible said, God formed man. God created man. So, our body essentially does not belong to us. And we also agree that God gave us this body for a purpose. The body is not our own. It's not our property. God created this body. God made this body for a purpose. And the purpose is what? To do His will. The purpose is to serve Him. So, the belly is not for food, essentially. The belly is not essentially made for food. Eating is not for pleasure. So, if by reason of food, your stomach is now protruding, then it means that you are overeating. If it is by reason of food and drink, that your stomach is now protruding because you are overeating, then you should know that the stomach is not meant for food. The Bible says, the belly for food, food for belly, but God will do what? God will destroy all of them. So, no excess eating, and nobody should grow a protruded tummy because of excess eating. If you are eating in excess, what are you doing? You are misappropriating God's resources. And to that extent, we can permit the leader who said, you are a thief. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I hope that is understood. Any other question? <laughs> well, somebody is adding. Yes, yes. Praise the Lord. My question is where we read in Leviticus chapter 25. The place says... 25 verse 23 says, The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with it. Then, our leader in the seminar says, It shouldn't be sold. Then my question now stands, uh, For instance, I'm an owner of land and uh, I want to dispose it for money. And the Bible is saying here that the land should not be sold because you are a sojourner. What do I do? Yes, let me start by correcting your question. You are not an owner of a land. Praise the Lord. He said, for instance, if he's an owner of a land, so, then you have to appreciate the fact that you are not an owner of the land. What did God say? That you are a sojourner. That you are what? A stranger. No stranger owns any land. It does not belong to you. God says, the land belongs to me. So, the first correction is that you are not an owner of the land. Please, we must appreciate the fact of divine ownership. We must understand it. We must accept it. It must become our attitude that even the house that you built on it is not your house. God owns it. That's the reason why God said, if you sell it, you must not sell it forever. It must not be in perpetuity. Praise the Lord. It must not be in perpetuity. And actually, in the, in, 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 in the days of, of, of the Bible in Israel, a man was not to sell a land forever. At the time of Jubilee, the whole thing returned to... Praise the Lord. So you can't sell a land forever. Even if a land was sold to you, when the year of Jubilee comes, it has to be returned. Praise the Lord. So, you can't sell a land forever. And even our governments, what they do is that when you give, when you get a plot from the government, when a plot is allocated to you, government does not sell that plot for you, to you forever. It is for how many years? 99 years. So, even government does not sell a plot to you forever. And there are cases that after 99 years you didn't go to renew it, government has the right to revoke it. So the land is not your own. You don't own any land. The land belongs to God. 
Please, can we have a question this way? Yes. yes. Hallelujah. In our class, we are told that a Christian should not take part in a competitive uh, games or sports. I want you to please explain further. Uh, because they mention uh, people like um, Holyfield, who came to be a Christian and get involved in uh, boxing and uh, football, all this kind of uh, sport. I want you to please explain this thing for that world. Pray. Eat or we drink, it must be to the glory of God. And that's, that's the verse to judge every action. That's the verse to judge everything that we do. And I want you to know that the Bible means that verse in every sense of it. It says, whatsoever you do, praise the Lord, whatsoever you do, whether you eat, or you drink, anything at all that you happen to do, do it to the glory of God. God is not a God of competition. Sports is allowed for us, but only for the purpose of exercise. Praise the Lord. Sports is allowed for us, but it's allowed for the purpose of exercise. And exercise is not meant only is not necessarily meant for competition. It is not supposed to be for competition for us. And so when you are engaging in a bodily exercise, it is not for competition. God is not the God of competition. And competition does not honor God. If you go and fight, if you go and, and kill somebody in sports, you see, the Bible says you should not kill. So if you go boxing and you box somebody to death, you have committed what? Mother. So why should you engage in a sport that will make you kill somebody? Those people who are boxing or those people who are wrestling, what is their end? If they can kill you, they are happy. If they can just give you one knock and then you don't stand up, do you think they will be taken to court? They won't be taken to court. So to that end, to that end, and beside God is not a God of competition. Competition for who? Who are you competing for? Praise the Lord. We have discovered in the seminary that we should not live any longer for ourselves. If you want to compete and win somebody, you are winning for who? Is it for God? Is it for God? Some people say that Tyson prayed before he went to eat. Well, let's leave that one to them. But we know that God is not a God of competition. Praise the Lord. It does not glorify God in any sense. Yes, maybe one more question. Please, first and foremost, I think we need to be aware of um, certain things. We didn't come for to make laws. As Abada is talking about, you need to understand the principles that we are learning. Praise the Lord. So don't hold on to some examples somebody gave and begin to flog it. The way I ask the question about land, you see, the scriptures of has explained, nobody owns land, and in Israel nobody can sell land. But in the world system, which we belong to, you may own land. But you are not allowed to use it as you like, because actually it is God that gave it to you in trust. So if God says you sell it, no problem. If God says you should not sell it, you keep it for him. Praise the Lord. Are you following it now? So the brother who is asking the question should not go and be, get confused. In the Bible, in Israel, you don't sell land permanently. It doesn't belong to you. Even the one that you say you is your own, is actually God giving you something in trust. And you can't sell it without Him. Even when He permits you to sell it, the money does not belong to you. You no longer live as you please. Everything that you have belongs to you now. So we are in the world, but we are not of the world. In the world system, people own land. And uh, you may be holding your land in trust for God. And if you say sell it, no problem. But know that even the money you got from it, you can't apply it back to any business you like, as you like. Praise the Lord. So please, I think that clears it. So brother, you can go and sell your land. <laughs> if it is your own, and live as you like. But if you now know that it is God's land, and God gave it to you to hold, then if I were you, I would ask God whether I should sell it or not. And if God says sell it, I say, well, what is the money for? Praise the Lord. So that even though we are in the world, we cannot be 
will not be consumed by the world. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Maybe one more question from this direction. Praise the Lord. Yesterday the, prayer, the man of God was saying something. <clears throat> Amen. He said that uh, our mothers, before they get, in fact, they, they, they are barren. And before they give birth to us, they go to the herbalists and they eat many, many things. And I want to, I, I want to know that, is it because in the, in the kingdom of darkness, did any man go to the, to the herbalist house, or a woman who is looking for a child, and in a baraventure there, the, the man help him and the woman deliver a baby or a baby boy. And I want to ask that, is it that, 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 that baby boy? Is it is a is a is a rich child from heaven or is it a child from, from from the kingdom of darkness? Praise the Lord. Next question. He's asking a question. He said yesterday the preacher mentioned something that you know uh, in those days some of the parents that were the mother was barren, they would go and consult a herbalist or a traditional doctor. And uh, after some things that are done, the woman takes in and delivers sometimes maybe a baby boy. Now, because the woman went to consult a traditional doctor or that the woman went to consult a witch doctor, and the baby boy is born, does not, does it mean that that baby boy is not from heaven? Or is it from heaven? Praise the Lord. Uh, we want to say that the Bible says, the earth and all that is therein is God. That's what the Bible says. The issue of going to consult a witch doctor is not correct. And that's not what he's trying to justify. And nobody should go and consult a witch doctor for a baby. And of course, you know, some of those babies that are born by those means, either they came from the waters and all of that, and the history is that they usually die and go back to the waters. Praise the Lord. So that's what happened in most of the cases. But if you didn't die and uh, you are still living, let's forget about that fact that you came from either by one of those arrangements, you are still living, and let's agree that as long as you are living, as long as you have a body, as long as you are a human being, let's fulfill the purpose of God for your life. Praise the Lord. So the question of whether you are from earth or from heaven does not arise. You are still a human being. And the Bible says the whole earth belongs to God with the inhabitants therein. So I don't think it's the issue of, of trying to find out whether you come from heaven or you come from earth or you belong to God or you don't belong to God. The Bible tells us that heaven and the earth is the Lord with everything therein. So I think that, that, that is enough for that purpose. Let's turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. Let's try and, and conclude so that we pray. Genesis chapter chapter 2, not 15. Genesis chapter 2, let's look at verse 15. Verse 15, the Bible says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To dress it and to... Keep it. So, when God found man, in chapter 1, you will discover from verse 26, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our own image. Verse 27, the Bible says, So God created man in his own image. Verse 28, And God blessed them. And all that, all that happened. We have agreed on one thing that we are not of our own. 
the body that we have, how did we come about it? It's because God formed us. We have agreed to the fact of divine ownership that what we see, the Bible says that all the earth is His. The Bible says that the heaven, the heaven and the heavens of heaven, they belong to God. He said the earth also and everything that dwells in. The Bible says the souls are mine. The souls are mine. So we have agreed to this one fact, how we came about this body, how we came about our existence, that it is God that formed us. And so when God formed the man, he formed the man for a purpose. We have agreed that God formed the man to do his will. God formed the man to do his work. And God formed the man not for himself, but for God. So in verse 15, the Bible now tells us that after God has done all of that, he said he took man and put him. He took man and put him in the garden of Eden. And the purpose was for work. The purpose was to dress it and to keep it. Praise the Lord. Adam was given something to keep and not something to own. Praise the Lord. That is what we are talking about, stewardship. Keeping does not make it your own. Keeping actually means that you are holding it for the owner. Are you seeing how God made man from the beginning? This was how God made man. So when God committed resources into the hands of Adam, whether they be flowers, whether they be fruits, whether they be land, whether they be whatever, what did God tell Adam to do? To keep it. Praise it. Praise the Lord. God told Adam to keep it. And he told him to dress it. To tend it. And if Adam tended one flower, and one flower was looking very fine, who was he tending it for? He was tending it for God. If the flower became so beautiful and did well, if he tended orange, and orange grew and brought forth plenty fruit, I mean fruits, Adam could be excited. But why was he excited? Praise the Lord. He was excited because should God come and look at it, God is going to be excited. Praise the Lord. If you employ somebody on your farm, or you employ somebody to keep your chicken, and he has fed your chicken so well, and they are looking very happy, why is he doing that job so well? It is for the fact that when the owner comes, he should be what? Happy. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If Adam did any job well, he did a job for the fact that God will be pleased. God will be pleased. So, doing something was first and foremost for pleasing God. That was the aim, that was the motive, that was the objective of his work, to dress it. If it looked fine, if it brought forth much fruit, it was for who? For God. But does that mean Adam will not be happy? He could also be happy. But he is not happy in himself. He is not happy because he has done something for himself. He is happy because he has done something for who? For God. And if God should come about, and like we saw in chapter 3, that God will come around in the cool of the day, and God looked at the work, and God was satisfied the work, what was he going to tell Adam? He was going to tell Adam, thank you, well done. And when a man tells a servant, well done, what happens? The servant is happy. Happy because he has done what? He has satisfied his master. And this was why God created Adam. For who? For God's pleasure. Praise the Lord. The Bible makes us understand earlier that God planted every need of Adam in the garden. So when Adam was put in the garden to tend it, to dress it and to keep it, it was not essentially for his food. Praise the Lord. It was not essentially for his food, but it was to please God. It was to make God happy. It was to keep it for God. And now the devil came around in chapter 3, and the devil told Adam, that Adam, you are mumu. How can it be that you are not doing something to please yourself? How can it be that you are just living to please somebody? How can it be that you have mortgaged your pleasure to the pleasure of somebody? 
You see, for Adam, if God was pleased, Adam was pleased. Do you understand? That's the typical position of Adam, and that was how God created him. If God was pleased, Adam was what? Pleased. If God was not happy, Adam was also not happy. So Satan came around in chapter 3 and told him, he said, you are mumu. How can you not gauge your life to somebody else? If the person is happy, you are happy. How can you just live for the pleasure of somebody? Even for eating, you are not eating for your pleasure. You are eating to get strength to walk. He said, no, that's not how you should be living. Even for dressing, you cannot dress to please yourself. Whatever you do, you are doing it for the pleasure of somebody else. So the devil came around and told him that, no, you are mumu. He said, you need your eyes to be opened. Praise the Lord. He said, you need to have your eyes opened. So he said, if you eat this tree, what is going to happen to your eyes? Your eyes is going to be open. Your eyes is going to be open. You wouldn't be like this any longer. And so man went ahead and ate that tree. He told him that the moment you eat of it, you are going to be like God. You are going to have independence. You should do something for yourself. You should dress to satisfy yourself. You should eat to satisfy yourself. You should wear something to satisfy yourself. You should do something to make you happy. This was how man came about with a self life. Praise the Lord. This was how man came about with a self styled life. This was how man started living for himself. But before this time, man was living for the pleasure of God. If man did anything, if man kept anything, if a man dressed anything, he was doing it with the objective of pleasing God. So the devil came and told him that, no, it shouldn't be like that. He said, eat this thing and then your eyes will be open and then you'll be like God. You will begin to possess. You will begin to own. This one that you are having things around you and yet you don't own anything is not correct. You should own something. You should have something on your own. So that you can say, this is my own. Praise the Lord. And the devil hid to the council of, of uh, sorry, Adam hid to the council of the devil, the wife, that is Eve. And when Adam came, he also gave him other fruit and he ate. And the Bible says, and their eyes were opened. That was the origin of living for self. So this self that we are not living for, now that we are not living for our life, that was not how God created us. When God created us, He created us for Himself. To live for His pleasure. Man never owned things. Man never was a possessor of anything. Whatever was in His control, it was for what? For keep. Praise the Lord. And if you must be relevant, you must agree with this divine fact of ownership. You must agree that it is not in the intention of God, it was not in the divine plan of God that man should own anything. Although God allowed man to partake and to share in everything, everything was made for man. And yet only a keeper, only a manager, only a caretaker. And when we know that, we are going to know that we are managers of God's resources that are committed into our hands only for the purpose of serving God. Even our body. So the hair that you have, if you are going to behave right and you entered into, into you wanted to make your hair, what should be your, your question? You see, it is not for yourself. Praise the Lord. The body that you have, if you wanted to make any particular dress, what should be your first attitude? That this body is not for me. Praise the Lord. And so, Adam, if you live like Adam, when God created him, he will dress to the pleasure of God. He will eat to the pleasure of God. The Bible says that ye are not your own. You must understand that. It must become your attitude that you are not your own. The body is not for yourself. And if you should use it for your own pleasure, it is God's resources and to that extent, you are stealing what belongs to God to do your pleasure with it. And the Bible says we are going to account for it. Praise the Lord. Whatever you do with this body, 
you are going to account for it. Whatever you use your body for, you are going to account for it. The Bible says it is not our own. The body does not belong to us. The body is given to us of God and is for the purpose of doing His will. It's for the purpose of pleasing Him. It's for the purpose of doing the will of God as long as we live. So the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 14 where we read, that whether we live or we die, it doesn't make any difference. If we live, we live for God. If we die, we die also to God. Praise the Lord. Man is not supposed to own anything. If we realize, if we knew the scripture, we belong to God, and whatever God has given us, it is for keep. And in that sense, it also follows that whether I have or I don't have, does it make any difference? It doesn't make any difference. If I have a car, it is still not my own. It is God that gave me that car. Isn't it so? It belongs to God. God has only allowed me to be a partaker of that resource. It does not belong to me. It is owned by God. It is God that has it. He is only allowing me to share it. So, if that is the position, whether I have a car or I don't have, does it make any difference? It doesn't. If I have money or I don't have money, does it make any difference? It doesn't. Praise the Lord. Because we are living for God. If I should have money in my pocket, does it become my money? Does it become my money? No. The fact of divine ownership must be accepted by all of us. If we are going to be relevant for God, if we are going to live useful life for God, if we are going to live and fulfill the purpose why we were born and we were born again, it is for good works. Praise the Lord. And God has given us our body as a resource. It does not belong to you. One thing we want you to appreciate from this moment is that God owns everything, including your body, and that your body does not belong to you. Body is not given for food. There is more to lie than food. That's what the Bible tells us in Matthew. That there is more to life than food. There is more to the body than dressing. Praise the Lord. There is more to the body than sensual pleasures. God did not give you the body to fulfill the desires of your human nature. To fulfill your sensual gratification. No. The body is not for fornication. The body is not for immorality. The body is not for uncleanness. It must be kept for God. It was given to us from God, of God, for His purpose. Praise the Lord. Eating is for a purpose. You see, but the devil told, you know, the woman, it shouldn't be like that. You should eat to have your pleasure. The eating is to serve for strength. Eating is to give us strength so that we will do the will of God. If we eat, we are eating for the purpose of nutrition, to keep this body fit, to keep this body strong, so that when we do what? We will do the pleasure of God. The Bible says, where is that land whose princes eat for what? For pleasure. Praise the Lord. And so if we appreciate that, and if we recognize that, then what should be our attitude? What should be our attitude? Our attitude should be that we worry not. Praise the Lord. Our attitude should be that we worry not. Because you don't possess anything. If a man should choose for live, to live for God, the Bible says God has planted everything for your need. God has planted everything for your need. You are not going to lack because you are living for the pleasure of God. When a man lives for God, God takes care of him. But if you should live for yourself, then you are inviting trouble for yourself. Are you understanding? Are you understanding? If you live for yourself, if from this moment you still decide to live for yourself, to own things for yourself, to grab things for yourself, to hold, to possess for yourself, to satisfy yourself, then you are inviting trouble in your life. When a man lives for himself, God also gives us on him. He allows him to take care of himself. But if you live for God, the Bible tells us that God planted every need of Adam. 
So don't be bothered with the fact that if I don't have money, then what's going to happen to my children's school fees? Do you want God to plan for your children's school fees or you want to plan for it yourself? You see, this is going to have a problem. This is going to be somehow difficult for us to, to be able to assimilate it. But I'm praying that God will help you to understand. You see, because all along we didn't live like this. All along we have been taught to possess. All along we have been taught to have. All along the world system have told us that the more you have, the more important you become. All along the world system have gauged a man by the amount and quantity of what he has. But God is now making us to understand that his intention for us is that we should be managers. What he has given to you, he has given to you by trust. We are going to continue, we are going to be going down to see how we handle our bodies, how we handle our heart, our eyes, our feet, our legs, and whatsoever. Even our money, which God has allowed to come to us. It is not our own. God has given it to us for a trust. God has given this body to be able to please Him. Your body is to please God. Not for sin. Not for fornication. Not for stealing. Not for accumulation. If you should give up on the issue of ownership and allow God to own everything for your life, you are going to discover that your life is going to flow in the hands of God. Your life is going to be relevant. God is going to find you useful. Our body is the resource that God has given to us. And we must realize that it is not our own. We must realize that God made it for himself, for his purpose, not for food, not for dress. But for who? For his pleasure. Praise the Lord. So shall we pray? Keep committing fornication in your body. That will become the attitude of your life. That even the risk watch is not my own. Then you are not going to be living for yourself. In the membership is because somebody is the owner. The basis of stewardship is because somebody is the owner. And we agree that God is the divine owner. God is the divine owner of everything. We saw how that it was the devil that deceived man to begin to live for himself, to begin to live to please himself, that God is the divine owner. The Bible says even the wicked, God has made him for the day of trouble. Praise the Lord. So he is the divine owner. He is the divine owner of our lives. He is the divine owner of your body. Is the divine honor of your clothes. Is the divine honor of everything that exists in this world. And the Bible tells us that they were created by God for His glory. The body is not meant for fornication. The body is not meant for cheating. The eyes is not meant for seeing some other things that will not give God glory. And as we, as we, as we begin to conclude this session today, we are going to pray again. We are going to resolve with our heart. Paul said, I have determined, I have made up my mind more than ever before that God will be glorified in my body. That's what he said in Philippians. That as it has always been my mind, as it has always been my attitude, it has always been my resolve. Now, much, much much more now, if we have ever determined that God will be glorified in our lives, it is now. If we have ever resolved to consecrate all to God, it must be now. Our tongue, our eyes, our hands, our feet, everything must glorify God. Praise the Lord. So I hope you understood the Bible study very well. And we are trusting God that the issues are not too many. But let's give time for some questions. If there's one or two questions that you want to ask, maybe you didn't ask it because of time in your group, and you want to ask it, please can you ask it now? The problem of idle words. And I remember in our group, one of the areas is the way we use the name Jesus. Sometimes we also use praise the Lord to keep people waiting. I don't know what 
No, or sometimes, personally, I will, I will say praise the Lord without thinking about it. You know, no meditation, no thought. You know, it just comes out. I don't know what you think about it. And, you know, sometimes Frank Oliza will also say praise the Lord. You know, there are some moments you do it, it ridicules the name of God. See, particularly to a non-believer. Particularly to a non-believer. And most of the times, when you tell a non-believer it is well, you see, it makes him complacent. It just makes him believe that there is nothing wrong with him. I mean, why? You t- the Bible says, say to the wicked, what? So why do you tell a non-believer a wicked mind is well? You know, it is all part of our idol worlds. And you see, we have, we have come to associate some of those things with Pentecostalism. We have come to associate them with spirituality. Um, it is good to be full of God. It is good to speak the word of God. You know, let it become our life. But we must be careful of Especially some of these phrases that have become the order of the day. Praise the Lord. If you will take note, they have become the order of the day. Uh, even in church, it has become a system. And you see, anything that becomes a system ceases to be inspirational. Praise the Lord. Even in church, if anything becomes a system... If anything becomes a habit that men can do it almost unconsciously, then it is no longer spiritual. It is no longer revelational. But you see, we must be led of the Spirit and we must do everything to the glory of God consciously. We must do it consciously. We must maintain God consciously in our thoughts. Uh, there may be practices that we have indulged ourselves in over the years, but It is good that we are beginning to think about them. It is good that we are beginning to be conscious about them. Particularly where you are using it. There are some places where you say such a thing and it just ridicules the name of God. And I've seen unbelievers say such things, I mean, without without a second thought. They just say it because everybody is saying it. And sometimes I have wanted to preach to some people, but you see, the way they will talk, they will just make you think that they are also believers until you know their life, then you know that these people are not believers. So let's not commonize the things of God. Praise the Lord. The things of God should not be made common. We must retain the sanctity of the word of God. We must retain the sanctity of the things of God. Yes, can we take another question? Hallelujah. Please just ask your question. Ask your question. Yes. Okay. As I went through First uh, Timothy chapter two verse nine, I discovered that something seems to be yearning for expression in our study, and that is the hair on our heads, the hair on our head. Now I just want to ask: In what manner are we to uh, treat our hair, with reference to women and men? That is my question. Praise the Lord. We must again state the principle. And what is the principle? God is the divine owner. Praise the Lord. Let's have these principles at heart. Let's accept them and let's walk by them. God is the divine owner. If you agree that even your hair does not belong to you, then it belongs to God and must only be employed to the pleasure of God and not your pleasure. Praise the Lord. So, your hair should be used to God's own pleasure. Your body should be for God's own pleasure and not for your own pleasure. I mean, God's own pleasure and not your own pleasure. So, that's the principle. Everything belongs to God. God has given it to us. God has loaned it to us and it is for His own glory, not primarily for man's glory. So, but as a principle, as, as a rule of the church, all women should cover their hair why in church? 
men can leave their heads open. We are not getting into any debate about it. But let me just ask you, if you are a woman and you don't want to cover your hair, what is the reason? Is it not for yourself? Praise the Lord. Is it not for yourself? If you think keeping your hair like that makes you beautiful, that beauty is for who? A beauty that does not satisfy God. A beauty that God is not happy about. And let me tell you one thing. That you are happy does not mean God is happy. And people have made this mistake. Some people say, I dress to my satisfaction. I live to my happiness. And I know that when I'm happy, God is happy. One woman I was going to wear. So I asked her, is it all those dresses you want to buy? Why do you want to buy them? You say it is good. As Christians, we should, we should, we should, we should look good. And when we look good, God is also happy. Praise the Lord. There is nothing bad in looking good. But I also want to understand that, that you are happy does not necessarily make God happy. But you see, whenever God is happy, you can be happy. Praise the Lord. Whenever God is happy, you can be happy. So let's seek to satisfy God first. Let's seek to glorify God. Let's seek to live for God and not to live for ourselves. As the rule in the church, all women should cover their hair. The churches of God have no other practice. And you see, let me tell you something. I don't think we know God more than some of these are brethren that have gone before. It's because some of the things they touch, the way they saw God, we have not seen God like them. So let's not think that all the people that lived ever before us, let's not think that all the church, all the brethren that existed up to this moment, they live in error. It is only you that know how to interpret Bible. That would be a very great mistake. That would be a very great mistake. The churches of God have no other rule. Praise the Lord. Can I take a question on this side? Yes. Praise the Lord. My question is that um, our teacher taught us that um, our heart is deceitful that uh, in fact we should not decide with our heart to do things anyhow. And my question goes like this. You know, okay, according to his say, some people, they can go to their mother and their mother will tell them that uh, in fact since over three days you have not eaten anything. That you should not decide with your heart and just put your hand in your pocket and give money to her. So does that mean that when you give when your mother told you that she is hungry, that she didn't eat over three days, you should not give money to her. And how fat is it that whenever you come next time with the Bible to preach to her, didn't she say that, uh, in fact, I beg you yesterday to give me something you, you disagree? Praise the Lord. We must state again that all that we have is of God. And it is God that gave us. Praise the Lord. And all that we have belongs to God. And God has given us those things as managers to administer it, to dispense it. And God has called us to every good work. If your mother comes and tells you that he is hungry and you have money in your pocket, I don't think it is bad to give her. But I think what the brother might be talking about is he might be trying to mention something that that we almost do naturally without a second thought. There is what we call a natural love. You see, a love that is that it is ours by nature and is the type of love that you have for your wife for your father for your immediate brethren for your immediate relationship let's say your uncles your aunties and all of that we must also make a distinction 
that that love is natural. That love is natural. It is ours by nature. For example, if your junior brother who is in the university comes and tells you that they ask him to bring 3,000 and you have 3,000 in your pocket, you are not going to be praying. You are not likely going to be praying and asking God, do I give him this 3,000 or not? If another brother in church, who you know is a brother, perhaps is even your Bible study leader, comes from the university and tells you that they needed 3,000 and I don't have it. I went to my brother, he said he doesn't have it. He said, if you have the 3,000, can you give me? You are almost going to tell him that, wait, let me pray. If you cannot tell your blood brother that, wait, let me pray before I give you 3,000, and you tell a fellow brother that, wait, let me pray before I give you 3,000, then something is wrong. Something is wrong. And that must not be our attitude. That must not be the love with which we love. I think that's what the group leader must be making mention of. Praise the Lord. Okay, maybe one more question. Yes. Praise the Lord. Um... I have an observation. Not a question. I know, yes, a question. But I want to say something. Please, you ask, see, ask. If you have a question, ask a question. Okay, this is the question. Looking at the people on that, this program, the first person there is a lady, I think. And he's wearing a blouse and Praise a the blouse. Lord. Please, just wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Can you sit down? Yes, let's take another question. <laughs> yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's listen to a question. Later we will take the observation. <laughs> My question goes like this. And I, I want to ask, I want to know this. Is it good for our sisters to be palming their head, apart from covering the head? Palming the head, I believe that the Bible said that we should cover, the women, the sisters should cover their heads. Somebody was saying, uh, I mean, a man of God was teaching us some time ago, he said that in those days... Please, let's be quiet, let's be quiet, let's listen. Somebody is asking a question. The man of God said that in those days, they know that all those worldly, I mean, uh, those unbelievers, sisters, or mothers, those who pound their head, that they know them, that they are prostitutes, or let me say Karwa, anyway, this way he was telling that, they want to know them. That's in all in, in these days, about 70, 60, those times. But I want to know that, is it good to palm the head, the hair. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, I hope certain things we have said may have taken care of that question. And if we correctly understood this principle, what we are talking about, we are talking about stewardship. We are talking about what we have belonging to God. And God has given us for his own glory. Um, we will not be drawn to make a categorical statement. But I just want you to know that what God has given you, he has given you for his own glory. And the emphasis is that God must be glorified. Praise the Lord. I've also made a statement that said that you are happy does not necessarily make God happy. So I think that is sufficient.
that is sufficient. Let's know that all that we have is for God. And if God should help us to stop living for ourselves, if God should help us to stop living for our pleasure, then God is also going to help us to be able to please Him with our body and with all that we have. We also have said that the hair is not given to you for your own pleasure. It is given to you for God's pleasure. And you must make sure that God is first and foremost happy. Praise the Lord. Okay, let me take a question from this end. The last question, then we will... Yes. Yes. Please quickly come so that we will pray together. Praise the Lord. Uh, Our teacher said, when we are discussing about what we can hear and what we can see. Now we talk about uh, the radio and television as of now. This is okay. For whatever, we, if we see bad things in television, it's still bad. But he said, but for the world now, that is no longer even tuning to BBC to hear the news, for the world now don't have any good news. But the news is of evil. Now I want to ask a question. For this present time we are now, we, we know we are at end time. How are we to observe, to know what is exactly happening for us to be applying wisdom? For Bible says that we should, we should watch and pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I hope we are not losing the essential facts of this study. As we ask some of these questions, I hope we have it at the back of the mind that we are not losing the essential aspect of this study and what the study is all about. Our ears must be employed for God and not for the devil. We have said in the study that your ears are a gate to your heart. And whatever comes through your ear goes right into your mind. So Jesus also said, be careful how you hear. He said, be careful what you hear. So, tuning your, your radio carelessly. See, I was just passing. I don't, I don't hear house a very frequent. I don't hear house. Let me put it like that. I was just passing and uh, somebody tuned his radio to, I think was it FM or so, and uh, they were speaking in Hausa and I was going with somebody who hears Hausa and he just told me what they were saying in Hausa. And let me not say it here. But you see, that is how tuning your radio carelessly will make you hear some careless things. Do you understand? That is what we are saying. That is how tuning your radio carelessly. And some of you leave it permanently at FM. FM plays throughout the day in your office. And what are you going to be listening? What are you going to be hearing? It is those boys, those girls who are making you laugh and laugh endlessly. It is those boys, those girls, those things they are saying, filthy things, and they are passing through your mind, they are passing through your ear. The Bible says, the Bible says, the eye, the ear, they are the root to our heart. They are the root to your mind. And so you should guide your mind. Praise the Lord. That's what we read. We read that you must watch over your mind. You must watch over your heart. You must watch over, over yourself. And how do you watch over your mind without watching over what your ears hear? How do you watch over what passes through your mind without watching what your eyes see. So, I hope he didn't say you shouldn't tune your TV, but if you are tuning your TV, is it to be seen women kissing men? Is it to be seen men playing love? Is it to be seen, seeing some ladies dancing almost half naked? 
Is it we see some people leaving their parts of the body naked? Is that what you want to see? So, know how to tune your television. Our brother has once said that television is the devil's box. But the good thing about it is that it has a knot. You can tune it on, you can tune it off. So, tune it on, but know when to tune it off. And that is how most children have been spoiled because of things we have allowed them to watch carelessly. You must exercise control over your television. If you must leave your television in the parlor for your children also to be watching, then you must make them know when to tune it on and when to tune it off. But the best thing is that please try and control it. Have a control over it because whatever passes through your eye, whatever passes through your ear, goes straight to your mind. And a man is defied by his mind. Praise the Lord. Let's turn our Bibles to Second Corinthians chapter 8 as we try to pray. Whatever has been contained in this outline is very necessary, very crucial. The vital information for holy living, vital information for living right so that God can be glorified in our life. Second Corinthians chapter 8 and I read from verse 5. The Bible says, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Praise the Lord. This is what Paul testified concerning these brethren who sent herbs, who sent resources for the brethren. And he said before they ever sent their resources, before they ever did anything for God, what did they do first? They gave themselves. And that is what we are saying, the body is ours of God. It is God that has given us, it is not our own, and it must be given to God. The first thing a man will ever give to God, it is his body. If every other thing you are going to give to God is going to be correct, the first thing you must give God is your body. And whenever God demands something from any man, the first thing God demands about a man is his body. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, having given their lives, having given their, their own selves, then they were also able to give. Once you have surrendered yourself into God's hands, then it becomes easy to give any other thing to God. It becomes easy to live for God. So the first thing you will ever give to God is your body. You must give up on your body. You must give up on yourself. You must refuse to own yourself. You must determine, you must, this must be your attitude, that your body is God's body. He has given it to you, and it's a resource for glorifying Him. And we must give our bodies to Him first. And when we do that, living for Him becomes easy, because we are not living for ourselves. Having given ourselves to Him, then we are able to give whatever we have. So that when a man has money and has paid tight, it doesn't say it is only 10%. Even after paying tight, what remains also belongs to who? To God. Because if you have given your body to God, then the rest of what you have belongs to God. The Bible says they first gave themselves, and then they were able to give whatever they had. And let me tell you that God is wanting to use human instruments. You are a human trumpet, not an iron trumpet. God is wanting to speak through a man. So when God is talking of a vessel, he is not talking of any other object other than a man. He is wanting to use you as a person. And if God must use you, that is why you have to give your body to him. If you must become a vessel for God, if you must become a resource for God to bless other lives, then you must submit your body to Him. It's because the person God wants to use is you. 
Praise the Lord. The person God wants to use is you. God no longer uses people like he uses them in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, when God is using any man, he is using the man in total. His will is involved. His entire personality is involved. Sometimes somebody stands up and he wanted to prophesy. He felt something was telling him to prophesy. And yet another thing was telling him to sit down. That is how God is operating. The word of God comes through you, but it does not come without your personality. And so the first thing that must be submitted to God is you. Praise the Lord. Our great men of God that have gone before us is just because of your personality. The difference between you and Brother Paul is nothing but yourself. Between you and Brother Peter is nothing but yourself. The difference between you and Charles Finney is nothing but yourself. So, giving a correct person, are you understanding? Giving a correct person, there is no limitation before any man. Jesus himself said, the things that I do, he said greater things. Praise the Lord. That's why the first thing to submit to God is what? Yourselves. Because that's what makes the difference. That's also what is the fundamental limitation. Praise the Lord. That is also what is the fundamental limitation. The way you think is important. The way you talk is your person. The Bible tells us, we read in Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus was able to be humble because he had a humble mind. Praise the Lord. Your attitude is a product of your thinking. If a man is proud, he is proud because he thinks proudly. If a man talks too much, he talks too much because he thinks... <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. That's what we read. That's what the scriptures say. You commit fornication because of the way you think. You tell lies because of the way you think. You cheat because of the way you think. You are a slave to money because of the way you think. And that's why we say that our eyes must be watched. Our ears must be washed. Watch what you see with your eyes. Watch what you see with your ears. Because they are an hero, they are a gate to your heart. So the Bible says you should look straight. The Bible says you should have a single mind. You should have a guided mind. You should have a single focus. And you see, the Bible also says that wherever your treasure is, what happened? There are also, for whatever you treasure, that is where your heart is going to be. And that's where our will becomes important. We must summon all our will to do the will of God. You must use your will to command your body to obey God. Praise the Lord. We must use our minds. We must, we must make up our minds. So Paul said, much more than ever before. He said, I have determined, I have made up my mind, God will be glorified in my body. But much, much more now. If we ever resolve to live for God, it is now. And we must employ our will. Our will is not left for us to use it on sensual pleasures. We must mortgage our will to the will of God. I hope you know that Jesus also had a will. Some of you think that Jesus was just a remote control that was controlled from heaven. He says, I can do nothing of my own self. He said, I didn't come to do my will. And you think that becoming born again... Once you are born again, that is all. You are just born again. And some people just say, I am born again. 
It doesn't end there. You must resolve. You must gather your will. You must gather all your strength. The psalmist said, one thing have I desired. How many things? One thing. That's a single eye. One thing. How many things are flowing through your heart? How many things are your mind stayed upon? A single eye. So the Bible says we must look straight. We must look straight. We must guide our mind. The heart of a man is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. In Proverbs chapter 16, the Bible also tells us that all the ways of a man are right in his own eyes. If we leave you to point out something bad about yourself, there's nothing bad about yourself. All you can tell is a good report. All you can tell is a good report. Even when you fall into sin and you have gone to confess, how do you start it? You say, Kai, I thank God. I gave my life to Christ five years ago. And all these five years, I just thank God that God has been helping me so well. I just don't know. You see, that is how you start your confession. You first of all start by praising yourself. The Bible says, all the ways of a man are correct in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. So the psalmist says, judge me. Examine me. He said, all the veins, all the, all the aspects of my life are submitted to you. We must submit all ourselves to God and we must leave ourselves to the scrutiny of God. Praise the Lord. It is God first. God must be happy before we are happy. God must be pleased before we are pleased. So we saw that our ears, our hands and our feet, watch the places you go. Don't loiter about. Don't just go about endlessly. If you don't have anything to do in your house, take your Bible and read. Because it is idleness that causes you to go and visit another woman and that is how you start gossiping. Let not your feet carry you to a place of gossip. Let not your feet carry you to a place where you see something bad. Don't use your hands. Don't use your eyes. Jesus even said that if your eye will cause you to do what to see, what should you do to it? You should pluck it out. That is better you go to heaven with one eye than with your two eyes you go to hell. So, which of them do you prefer? Having two eyes and going to hell? Rather than having one eye and going to heaven. So we must watch over it. We must watch over our feet. We must watch over our hands. We must watch over our ears and our eyes. All of them must be employed to the glory of God. They were made to serve God. They are resources that God has given us for ministry. Praise the Lord. Our hearts must be full of the word of God. God must be retained in our thoughts. In the office, on the street, in the marketplace, we must cultivate a habit of retaining God always in our thoughts. And when we are full of God, there is no place for the devil. Praise the Lord. And so God has also given us time. And we saw the nature of time. We saw that time is, is short. That's what the Bible tells us. That the time is short. So whatever you should do now, do it because time is not your own. I hope you know that time is not our own. Have we agreed that time is not our own? Divine ownership. Divine ownership. If God allows you to live for 70 years, 70 years is not your own. If God gives you tomorrow, tomorrow is not your own. And that's why the Bible says that we should use it wisely. We should be circumspect. We should walk as wise men, not as fools. You don't have all the time to yourself. And if you know, your time is passing. So you can no longer engage your time in idle things. You no longer engage your time in things that does not profit. So you that ought to be teachers. Now that's what Paul told them, that by now you ought to have been teachers. What did you do with your time? You use your time in playing computer games. I know it's only that is what we are teaching our children. We just bring the thing and we think it's affluence. That my children can play computer games. They are there for three hours, four hours, 
five hours playing computer games. You are teaching them that time is theirs. You are teaching them that they can mismanage time. Time is not on our side. Time is not on our side. And that is how they will not do well in school. That is how they will not learn how to place priority on the things that matter. Time is given to us of God and we must engage it every minute, every second must be used for God. And the Bible says we are going to account for it. You are going to account for what you did with your time. You are going to account for what you did with your time. And those of you who are young, I just wish you ask somebody who is repenting at 60, 70. He will tell you that how he wish he repented at 30. Because his time has gone. Let it not be that when your time on earth is finished, you have not done anything for God. You have not fulfilled the purpose for which you were born. Praise the Lord. We are seeing that God has given us time as a resource for his ministry, for the work, and we must engage it for that. So henceforth our attitude. Philippians, open to Philippians, as we read it to pray. Philippians 1.20 Both our time, our mouth. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that your mouth should be guarded by your heart. Don't speak carelessly. Don't just allow words to fly out of your mouth. The Bible says, Men shall give account of every careless word, every idle word, every word spoken endlessly. And so you have to watch over your mouth and you should speak wisely. So Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 verse 20, he said, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, praise the Lord, see a man that has an expectation, see a man that has a hope, see a man that is willing to use all he has for God. And you see some of these questions we ask as if we are debating. As if we are arguing, it simply tells me that we have not made up our mind. And that is how you carelessly walk. That is how you see some things on television, and when you sleep, you start masturbating. That's the reason for so many masturbations. That's the reason for so many dreams. Because of the things you see. Because of the things you had. Our mind must be occupied by God. We shouldn't give our thoughts to evil things. Thoughts are going to fly over your heart. But don't meditate over them. Don't think about it. That is the meaning of thinking. Thinking means that you are entertaining a thought. The Bible says whatever is pure, whatever is holy, that is what our heart should think about. Don't entertain evil thoughts. Don't accommodate them. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. So the Bible says, according to my endless expectation and hope, that in nothing, in nothing I shall be ashamed. Have you resolved that fornication will no longer throw you down? Have you resolved that your mouth is no longer for backbiting? Is that the resolve of your heart? Are you telling God that God from this moment, my eyes are no longer for reading it the super? Are you telling God that God for this moment, my time is no longer for sleeping late at 1 p.m., at 2 a.m., at, a, at, a, at a 4 a.m., watching movies on Euro, on Euro what? What do you call it? It is not your time. It is not your time. So you sit down from, from, from 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock, you are watching movies. And what are they going to do to you? And what you are watching is a story of how one man cheated one woman. And as you watch, you say, my God, oh, I hope my husband is not cheating me like that. So when your husband comes back, you just start asking him questions that are baseless. Because of a movie you watched. Because of a movie you watched. Of what help? If a man cheated a woman, what does that got to do with you? What does that got to do with you? You shouldn't listen to the counsel of unbelievers. Unbelievers will tell you that, you see, all men are the same. 
your husband is not like men. Praise the Lord. Your husband is not like all men. So you must engage your time to the glory of God. So Paul say, as, as it has been, let's, let's complete that verse while we pray. In nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also, praise the Lord, as it has been my practice, as it has been my determination, so now also. And as I read it, it's like Paul was saying, if ever I had resolved to obey God, if ever I have resolved to please God, it is now. Much, much, much more now. My eyes, my feet, my heart, my, my everything. My everything is for God and must be employed for God. He said, God shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Whether it be by life or by death. Let it not be that the gift of life is what will make you to backslide. Do you understand what I say? Let it not be that if God allows you to live two more years, those years are the reason why you will not go to heaven. Those years should not be the reason why you will not go to heaven. So whether it be by life or by death, Christ shall be magnified in my body. Are you resolving like Paul? Are you resolving like Daniel? Are you resolving like Daniel? You must resolve. You must make up your mind. You must agree with God that look, whatever He has given you is for His and your body, everything about you, your heart, your mind is no longer for thinking on those things. It's no longer for thinking on useless things. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, He says, Every tree is known by what? It fruits. Whatever can be seen about you, that is exactly who you are. Praise the Lord. Whatever can be seen about you, that is exactly who your inside is. And let me tell you, the difference between making it and not making it, it is just because of your person. Your personality has so much to do with your Christian life. The way you live your Christian life is determined by who you are. It's determined by who you are. And so we must resolve to employ all that we have to the glory of God, our eyes, our hands, our feet, everything must be to serve God. So let's talk to God. Now that you are born again, there must be a difference. There must be a difference. That you are born again, there must be a difference. Agree that your body is no longer for fornication? Do you agree that your mouth is no longer for backbiting? From this moment, it is not for the devil. From this moment, your eyes are not for reading, for, for watching dirty films. Your mind is not for harboring evil thoughts. Your mind is not for harboring evil stories. Your eyes are not for reading every kind of book. Your eyes are for God. Given to you of God. And your mouth must preach the gospel. Your mouth must tell good news. Your mouth must not carry rumor. Are you a rumor carrier? Are you a bad biter? Are you using your mouth to cheat? Are you using your hands to collect bribe? It is a vessel that God is asking for. It is a person. It is your person. It is everything about you. And it must be submitted to God. So talk to God. Now that you are born again. There must be a difference. Tell God. Tell God he must be honored in your body. Ah, your eyes must be employed to see good. Continue after, but let's do the summary. Uh, we thank God that we have come to the 
end of the seminars and we want to believe God that he has taught us some definite things we want to trust that when we leave this place we shall be living on to every good work We've been looking at the stewardship of, stewardship of God's resources. We have agreed with the fact that God is the divine owner of everything. We have also seen it that out of His love, He has decided to make us partakers. He has decided to make us partakers. We saw it that it is the devil that deceived man to begin to live for himself, but that all that is available for man, God has only made him a partaker, a caretaker, to keep, to manage, and to dispense at his will, at God's will. So we went ahead and saw the various resources that God has given us, we saw that our body is ours from God. It's a resource that God has given us to be able to do His will, to be able to serve Him. And we concluded that it must be preserved for God. Our body must be preserved for God. Our heart, our mind, and our will. The body is not for fornication, it's not for sin. It must be preserved for God, it must be exercised for God, and it must be presented to God. So, those are the things we saw concerning the body. So, and we ask you some definite questions. We ask you, how are you handling your body? We said, what do you go about doing in this body? We are asking you, what do you use your mouth to do? What do you use your body to do? Is it to please yourself? Is it to commit sin? We say it must be presented to God. We say it is not our own, it is God that has given us, so we must handle it with care. We must keep the body heavy, and we must maintain our body to be heavy. We agree that the body is not for food. We saw it, the Bible said, the belly for food, the food for the belly, but God will destroy all of them. We agree that eating should be as it serves the need of the body. So eating is not first and foremost for pleasure. Eating is not first and foremost for taste. Eating is for nutrition to give the body what it needs to be able to serve God. Praise the Lord. So you must keep your body heavy. You must keep your body heavy because it is not your own. And if you waste it, God will ask you to account for it. We said you should not underuse your body, neither should you overuse it. Don't underuse your body. Don't spend too much time in leisure. Don't spend too much time in sleeping, wasting away your body. It must not be undernourished. It must also not be overnourished. Praise the Lord. We saw that time is ours from God. Time does not belong to man. Time belongs to God. And he has only given us time as a resource to do his work. Time does not waste for any man. And we said if you do not use time, time will use you. You are aging. And you will soon leave this world. You will one day pass away from this world. Before you know, 70 years is a very small thing. You never believe it that you are 30 years now, or 40 or 50. And if you are 50, you may be thinking you are still in your 
thirties, but you are actually in your fifties, and you can never come back to thirty. Sometimes you tell your wife that she's looking younger, but she's never looking younger. If she is fifty, she is fifty. You can't take anything out of it. So time is not ours. It's from God and we must use it for God. We also say that the talents that God has given us, they are from God. And you see, God has so made it that everybody has something. There is nobody that God has not endowed with a talent. There is nobody that God has not endowed with a gift. So, what is your gift? You must identify it. What is your talent? You must identify it. And everybody has a talent. Everybody has a talent. You can sing well, it's a talent. Do you have compassion on people? It's a talent. It's not everybody that has compassion. I hope you know that. It's not everybody that can have compassion on the sick. So, if you have compassion, if God has put in you the ability to be able to care, please, it's a gift from God. We must now begin to identify areas that we can be of use to God. And what we are saying is that what the Bible says is that everybody is endowed with a gift. Everybody is endowed with a talent. Some of you have the ability to make money. Even if it is coke you want to sell, it turns into money. If it is water you want to sell, it turns into money. Whatever you want to do brings money. It is a gift from God. It is a talent from God. It must be employed. Do you know how to sow? Do you know how to take care of children? Do you know how to play guitar? Do you know how to do one thing or the other? Is your body strong? And I hope you know it's not everybody that has a very strong body. If you are a very strong woman, use it to do something for God. If you can cook well, it's a talent from God. Use it for God. Whatever God has given us is a talent. And God has so made it that nobody is without a gift. And it must be employed. So, identify your talent, identify your gift, and make sure you do not die with it to the grave. You mustn't die with it. You must dispense it. That is why God has given you those talents, so that you should dispense of them, you should administer them for others. As we leave this place, we must be leaving this place unto every good work. Everybody must be involved in something. It is God that has called us for good work. Jesus said, for this purpose I came, to do the will O Lord. For this purpose you were born. For this purpose you were born. It's the devil that deceives you to live for yourself. But for this purpose you were born to do the will of God. So God must be glorified in your body. God has given us a will. Let's not use our will to do evil. Use your will to do good. Resolve to do good. Resolve to be useful in the hands of God. Praise the Lord. Every one of us is endowed with a resource, with a talent, with a gift, and we must employ it for God. And we say it specifically concerning talents that they must pass through the cross. That you have a good voice does not simply make it useful in the body of Christ. It must pass through the cross. If you can play guitar, if you have those talents, please submit them to God and let them pass through the cross and then they become useful for God. Praise the Lord. And we saw it that God is a good businessman. The talents he has given us, he has given us for profit. And if you will not make profit for it, you are going to account for it. We saw it that even the faith, the gospel that we have of God is given to us on trust. Is given to us on trust. So we saw the aspect of trustworthiness. Paul said, God considered him to be trustworthy, to commit the gospel into his hands. And so God expects that we are not going to use the gospel for our gain. Are you using the gospel for your gain? God expects that we will administer it free of charge. The faith that we have is the faith of God. 
And we saw Paul advising Timothy to keep it, to guide what he has jealously. And we admonish you to guard the faith that you have. We say watch your companions, watch your discussions, watch the places you go. The faith is yours from God and you must keep it, you must guide it, you must, you must take good, you know, uh, account of it. We also saw that the money that we have is given us of God and all the resources we have it is ours from God. Let's turn to to Luke chapter 12 in conclusion. As we round up the seminars, trusting God that we will be leaving this place unto every good work. Turn to Luke chapter 12. The parable of the rich fool. And he spoke a parable unto them, saying... He said, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plenty, I mean plentiful. And I want you to take note of that verse 16. The Bible says, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth what? Plentiful. What brought forth the plentiful? The ground. The Bible says, remember that it is God that gives you the grace to make wealth. It is God that gives you the ability to make wealth. If wealth is in your hand, it is the ability that comes from God. It is the ground that produces it, not your own. It is God that has given us all that we have. The talents, the abilities, the money, the wealth you have. Is it wealth of knowledge? Is it wealth of experience? Whatever aspect of wealth. It is God that has given you. It is not your own. And let it bring forth plentiful unto God. And not unto yourself. Verse 17. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. Are you seeing so many I, I, I here? He said, This will I do. I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits. And my goods. And I will say to my soul, So, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then, Whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Praise the Lord. And let me just ask you, if this man died, where do you think he will go? Why will he go for, to hell? He didn't commit fornication. He didn't steal. The things he had, he planted Brought it from his farm. So what sin did he commit that will take him to hell? Praise the Lord. He said, take thy ease. Are you taking ease? Are you taking ease with your life? Are you taking ease about the things of God? The time that God has given you, is it for ease? The Bible says, Woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. You just sit down on the bed, you lie, you lie, you lie, you lie, you sleep. Some sleep and turn this way, they sleep and turn this way. I think science has proved it to us that if an adult sleeps for, is it three or four hours in a day, that is sufficient. Three to four hours sleep in a day is very sufficient. You just sleep all through. You are taking your ease. You are taking your ease. This is what he said. He said, take your ease. He said, eat. Eat. These are the things that took this man to hell. He said, eat. And let me ask you. Are you sowing all your wealth in your food? All your money, 
do you spend it on food? I know as we are speaking like this, the thing looks so, so simple, but get to some people's houses and see the kind of things that are around their table. Let their wife bring food and then you see the kind of soup. Every type of meat is inside. Every type of meat is inside. He say eat. Is all your money going on food? Are you overeating? Do you think God has given you that money for yourself? You are overeating. You are spending it on food. The Bible says the belly for the food, the food for the belly, God will destroy all of them. Some of you sometimes you take a whole chicken. Some people can even boast that I have finished a chicken. These are the things that send this man to hell. He said, my soul, be at ease, eat, and do what? Drink. Drink. And this is what is consuming your money. This is what is consuming your money. And do what? Make merry. When you are doing your ceremonies, your child celebration or whatever, your anniversaries and whatever, some people make their savings in a whole year only to spend during a child cere- I mean ceremony. All the savings you have made in a year, it is for your wedding. And you are making a four-step cake. You are buying a ring of 10,000 naira. And you see, I don't know where this thing has come. You see, we say, if you can afford it, there is no need. But I want you to know that even if you can afford it, the Bible says the ground of a certain man brought forth plentiful. And it's not for yourself. That you can afford it is not for yourself. Praise the Lord. And if because you have gotten money and your standard of living is now changing, then be careful. Be careful. Praise the Lord. If your style of life will change simply because you have gotten money, be careful. Because you think you can afford it. The Bible said the ground of a certain man brought forth plentiful. Praise the Lord. Go to verse 42. It says, And the Lord said, This is, this is the other, the other, we've left the rich fool. Let's look at verse 42. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion in due season? Who is that wise steward, stewardship of God's resources? Even the men that are sitting under you in your church, they are resources from God. So they are not your own. And the Bible says, the things that God has committed into your hands, it is to be administered to his own household, to his own children. He said, blessed is that servant, verse 43, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find him so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he has. Faithfulness in stewardship is what brings promotion. The little thing that you are not doing now, the little that God has given you for which you are not using it effectively, God will never add to you. And as we studied, it looks like money is the basic test that God gives to everybody. Money is the basic test that God gives to everybody. If as a student you cannot give money because you think you are a student, you don't have. Even when you start working, you will not give. If you are earning 2,000 naira in a month, and you think 2,000 naira is too insufficient for yourself, when you start earning 10,000 naira, you'll be giving to God. Let me tell you that even if you earn 1 million, you won't give to God. You won't give to God. So faithfulness. In the little that you have, we must be faithful. The Bible says God has given it to us to administer to the household. It is God that gives us the grace to make wealth. 
And so if money has come, it has not come for you to eat. It has not come for you to change your wardrobe. It has not come for you to change your chairs. So you just wake up one day, you say, the chairs are old. Say, darling, let's change this thing. Why are you changing the chairs? Because you have used them just two years. It is not your money to be changing chairs. God has given it for his own household. Look at verse 45. He said, but, and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayed his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maid servants, and to eat and to drink, and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and we cut him in asunder, and we appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And the servant which knew, verse 47, and the servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit, let me take it again, but he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripe, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him, shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask for much. Praise the Lord. But look at what the Bible says is the portion of this servant. That he thinks because he can afford it. That he thinks because resources have not come into his hands. That he thinks because money has not come into his hands. The Bible says when the master shall come, where is his portion? Where is his portion? With the unbelievers. Please. Please. Men will go to hell on account of using God's money. This is what the Bible is saying. Men will go to hell on account of using God's resources for themselves. And if you think the money that is in your hand is your own, go ahead and use it. We are just simply talking about divine ownership. We hope you will believe that it is God that has given you. The Bible says it is God that giveth grace, the ability to make money. You think your salary that you are earning at the end of the month is your own, you can spend anyhow. Go ahead and spend anyhow. Go ahead and be drinking yogurt, be eating pepper soup, even when you have no need for it. Go ahead and garnish your table with all manner. Let your money enter your belly. This is just what the word of God is saying. He says, when the owner of these resources will come, where is their portion? They are not going to hell because of fornication. They are not going to hell because they have stolen. But this is actually stealing God's resources. And I hope we will understand and I hope we will give up to God. To agree with Him that what comes to us, comes to us from God. For this purpose were you born, not to live for yourself, but to live for God. Yesterday we said, they first gave themselves. They first gave themselves and they were able to give also of their resources. Why don't you give yourself to live for God and not to live for yourself? Why don't you give, administer the resources that God has passed through you for the body of Christ? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17. Just a little emphasis and then we'll begin to pray. We're hoping that God is making us to understand something. It is looking quite serious to me. He said, Child them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, no trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, 
who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, that they be rich in good works. It is not giving to make some people perpetually indebted to you. And some of you, when you just give somebody one maggie, it is that that woman will always be remembering you for that one maggie. And so when she starts something, you say, didn't you remember I gave you maggie? What is maggie? But because you gave somebody maggie, you think that man should be perpetually grateful to you. The Bible says it is ours from God for the purpose of doing good works, ready to distribute, willing to do what? Communicate. Willing to communicate. This is our ministry. This is the purpose which God has called us. This is the reason why God is giving wealth into our hands. It is to distribute. Money is to distribute. Money is meant for dispensing. It is not meant to keep. Are we listening? Are we listening? Money is meant for dispensing. I know some of us, why we are so lean is because we are not dispensing. You go to your house, it's only you and your wife. And maybe your one or two children that you have. Nobody visits your house because you are stingy. You are not dispensing. When you go to your village, nobody comes around you. You just go quietly like this, quietly like this, quietly like this, and then quietly you come back. And you are putting all the money in your belly because you are not dispensing. A man that is not dispensing will ever be little. A man that is not dispensing will ever be little. And some women will say, we are just can't have everybody around us. And so even if the husband is wanting to bring in men, you know, because the woman says, you know me, I'm not used to people. From this moment, make up your mind to be used to people. From this moment, make up your mind to open wide the door of your house. Let the brethren come in. Praise the Lord. Open your kitchen. Let people go and eat. Don't say, if they finish this food, what will happen tomorrow? The Bible says, tomorrow we take care of itself. Take no thought. Don't think about it. Live for God. As long as you are living for God, God has planted resources. That's what we saw in Genesis. When God formed man, he planted for him and planned for him. You want to plan for yourself or you want God to plan for you? Praise the Lord. And like our brother said, if God does not cook for you, you won't eat. If God does not cook for you, you won't eat. Please, administer your resources wisely. Administer them wisely. Let's put them in the work of God. They are given to us for good works, ready to distribute, willing to do what? To communicate. Let's open up our lives and allow people to come in. Why are you so reserved? Why are you so reserved? Open your life for the brethren. Let them come in. Let them come in. You are a resource for God. You are a resource for the people of God. He said, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. So he said, oh Timothy, keep that which has been committed to you. We have spoken about that when we are talking about our attitude towards, you know, the gospel that God has given it to us for trust. He said, we should avoid profane and vain babbling. Watch your communication. Watch your tongue. Watch your associations. We must preserve them. They are gifts. Our mouth is a gift from God. Our body is a gift from God. And the wealth that we have is a gift from God. Finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 12, verse 5. And then you begin to make up your mind to talk to God. Unto every good works. That's why you are born. You are not born to live for yourself. 
The Bible says, He died for us, that those of us who live should no longer live for themselves. And what is living for themselves? Eating all the money you have? Sticking to yourself? Not releasing yourself? Being so reserved, being so conserved, being so secretive? What, what is it that you are keeping a secret? So that if people know you have money, they will soon start coming and saying, please, I'm in need. Say, I don't know why there are so many poor brethren in church. If they just know you are in need, like, you know, do you have money like this? And so that's why even when you have your contracts, you keep quiet. You don't tell anybody. The only time you come and tell is that God is blessing us. And after you have paid your tithe, the rest of it is to yourself. The Bible says, when the master of those resources come, where will be your Lord? Among the unbelievers. So hold your money and you will hold it to hell. Is that too, is that, is that too much a statement? No. That's what the Bible says. Die leaving the millions in your account. Die leaving the thousands in your account. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, can somebody read it for us? He said, but and I will I'm reading it here, First Corinthians 12 verse 15, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Second, sorry, second, second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 15. Are you there? He says, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. I'm willing to spend what I have, and not only what I have, even myself, I want to spend it. He said, I will gladly, very gladly do that. I will spend all I have. Brother, go and spend all you have for God. Don't die living anything in this world. Praise the Lord. Don't die living anything for this world. Don't say I'm keeping it for my children. The Bible tells us, I think the book of Ecclesiastes, it says that man that keeps us and stores wealth for his children, who knows whether even his children are foolish ones and they take it and squander it on women and useless things. So who are you laboring for? Laboring for useless girls. Your children will just squander it upon them. Why don't you trust that God will take care of you? We are meant for spending. Spend your time. Spend your resources. Spend all that you have. By the time you are dying, you yourself be spent. By the time you are going, you yourself be spent. The Bible says, lay the treasures in heaven. The certificates that you have, they are not for you. They are an opportunity for God. The work that you have is not your work. It's an opportunity for God. It is a posting of God where you are. Are you in the market? Are you in a shop? Are you anywhere? It is an opportunity for God. Yesterday we sang, we said, God use me. Anywhere, anyhow. Where you are is the posting of God. Allow yourself to be spent. Open up your life. Throw yourself, your life into the gospel. Throw your life into the work of God. Live for good works. Be spent and be spent. Don't spend money for yourself. Don't think it is for yourself. To put it in all your food. To put it in all your children's dresses. What is covetousness? Covetousness is to have what you don't need. What is covetousness? It's simply to have what you don't need. So let me ask you, how many shoes do you have? And some of you here, there are some shoes that in a year you never wear one. When you leave this place, go and give out those shoes. Women, those boxes of dresses that you are keeping, four boxes, five boxes, 
Kamatam is now coming, you will say, please, go and dry them. Every Hamata, you bring all those boxes, you go and dry them, and then you go and keep them back. Year in, year out, they are there. It is covetousness. Covetousness is simply to keep what you don't need. Go and distribute those dresses. When you leave this place, look for the needy. Look for the hungry. Feed them. Feed them. Lay up your treasures in heaven. Where no thief will go and steal it. Where thief, no thief will go and steal it. It is meant for distribution. It is meant for communication. The reason why we are living is for good works. It would have been a punishment for God to leave us in this world of torment. In this world of, 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 of tribulation. In this world of sorrow. In this world of affliction. Where we get our lives to God. The best thing would have been that God tells us heaven. It would have been a wicked thing for God to allow us to remain on this earth. If not for good works. When you gave your life to God, there was no reason staying on earth rather than going back to heaven. Why should you continue in this world of affliction? Sorrow today, happiness in one minute, the next two days sorrow. The reason why you remain is for good works. For this purpose have I come to do thy will, O Lord. For this purpose were you born again to do the will of God. Will you resolve like Paul? Paul said, I will. I will. It is not by chance. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. Give yourselves to God. Offer your life to God. And tell yourself you will live for God. I will spend and be spent. By the time you are dying, leave nothing. Leave nothing. How many things did Jesus leave when he was dying? Nothing. Great men of God that handled millions. By the time they died, they left back nothing. And they are the ones we are telling their story today. And I said yesterday that the reason why you are so lean, the reason why you will die a mediocre, the reason why you will die nobody knowing your name is because you are just yourself. It is yourself that is your problem. Then release yourself into God's hands. Offer your life to God as a sacrifice. Say like Paul, I will. I will. Make up your mind to live for God. For this purpose were you born unto every good works. So as we leave this place, as we leave this meeting, everybody going unto good works. What you have and you don't need, give it out. Give it out. The rich who went to hell because of covetousness. Because of using everything for himself. And may we account for it. May we account for it. So why don't we give God a chance? Why don't we live for God? Why don't we throw all our life into God's hands? To live for him, to spend and be spent. Let's pray. You are-